This is the Stark Truth, hosted by Robert Stark. Brought to you by StarkTruthRadio.com. Robert Stark is an American journalist and political commentator. You can listen to his podcast at www.starktruthradio.com. This is uh, Robert uh, Stark. I'm joined here with uh, Ryan uh, England. He runs the Alternative uh, Left blog. Uh, Ryan, great having you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's been a while. And I'm also joined here with uh, Matt Pegan, to host. Okay, great to meet you, Ryan. Good to meet you, too. So, uh, we're going to be discussing the... The political implications of the events that have happened over the past week with uh, protest and civil unrest, and especially like to see if we can find a nuanced ground in such a polarized uh, situation. But to start things off, uh, Ryan, it's been a while since you've been on, so can you give give us some background information about yourself and about the Alt Left uh, project? Yeah, I uh, I uh, was almost born and raised around left wing politics. I've always felt um, kind of strongly about it, but kind of had mixed feelings about it too. Um, particularly, maybe in the last ten years or so, I've grown quite disillusioned with some uh, of the antics that we see on the left. It's becoming increasingly dogmatic, very authoritarian. Uh, developing a very much an us versus them with no uh, no neutrality, no middle ground, you know, no tolerance uh, for dissent, and it's kind of scary, really, to see the Western world have its first run in with authoritarian leftism. Uh, I guess if this were Russia or China, it might look a li- seem actually quite familiar, but uh, it's not good, and we don't know how to respond well to it here. I began with my blog and my page, uh, Alternative Left, on Facebook to promote, I guess, a more open-minded uh, sort of libertarian streak of leftism, one that's particularly critical of some of the, uh, the hardline identity politics, the critical feminist theory and critical race theory in particular. Very, uh, very dogmatic stuff, some of that, and I think kind of dangerous. Because uh, those trends in kind of leftist thought have been around, obviously, for a while, and, and especially in the 2010s really flared up. But it kind of seemed like over the past, uh, you know, the, for the few years of the Trump presidency, maybe, maybe they were waning a little bit in influencer credibility. But they've kind of come back in a, in a huge way just these past seven days. Yeah, it's never really gone anywhere. The nature of these ideologies is that people don't give them up very easily. Um, I think one of the main things about them is just how apocalyptic they are. They see everything in terms of some gigantic, monstrous evil, like patriarchy or colonialism or something like that, and it works kind of like a conspiracy theory in that uh, you just can't take a day off from fighting evil like this, and you don't get tired of it. So the ideology itself produces a kind of militancy. It's different than uh, past left-wing movements, uh, like a class-based left that was materialistic-minded, like how can we get goods to a greater number of people? But what is this whole ideology, woke ideology? It's basically like there is this, re- it is a religion in a sense, there is this religious fervor, like those photos of, a lot of these photos of protesters 
there's this footage of them like where they're repenting and it is like a religious ceremony of like a lot of them are like religious fundamentalists yeah it's tinged with a kind of gnosticism and uh and and as uh, as ryan said uh, a sense of of fighting evil that this kind of thing can't take even one day's break or that's somehow morally unjust um it's it's it couldn't be further from a kind of pragmatic materialistic leftism yeah yeah exactly although i mean you go over to say that the soviet union or maoist china historically and it was kind of like that too it's definitely a successor in a way to the puritan uh, strain in protestantism calvinism in particular that of course has very very deep roots in the united states we're seeing a kind of secular version of it here well you're seeing the alternative left and i think it's important to make the distinction i do remember that there were these like fox news was trying to smear smear that label with antifa but i think it's important to make make it clear that it has absolutely nothing to do with antifa but also, like, what do you think about this new scene? The anti-woke left, uh, people on Twitter like Amy Therese, Michael Tracy, and Anna Kachian? Um, I think they're an improvement over the woke left, for sure. Like, somebody like an Angela Nagel would kind of fall into that category, too. That kind oh, of yeah, thing. for sure. Yeah. So, you observed the protest. Uh, this was in uh, Calgary, Canada. Uh, were you there as a protester or just an outside observer? Well, I was, you know, I work for the public transit system where I live. So, and uh, because of the, the COVID-19, we've cut back service quite a bit. So I've gone back to working nights and that's not something I've done since I first started. So what I have to do then is I have to drive my car, park it at the garage and then go take the train up to the place where I take over the bus to do a night shift, take that bus back to the garage late late at night so I can have my car to go home with because by the time I'm done, the buses aren't running. So I'm walking um, from the garage to the uh, light rapid transit train that I have to catch to go beat my bus, and there's a big plaza there. And, yeah, there was a big, uh, big demonstration there. And this one was mostly peaceful? It was mostly peaceful, but interestingly enough, as I happened along, I start hearing all of this shouting, and it looks like there was some kind of confrontation going on between the huge bulk of the protesters that were obviously sympathetic to Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, most of them were minorities and so on, but it looked like there were some kind of counter-protesters there. And one fellow... In particular, he's wearing a Trump 2020 shirt on. Why he does that in Canada, I don't know. But anyway, push comes to shove. And what's kind of interesting, and I guess this will bear on our conversation, is that when the police moved to uh, to break things up, he was the one they, they grabbed. He was the one that got arrested. Oh, the right-wing the, guy. The, the right-wing guy, yes, yes. So, yeah, I mean, things are really uh, polarized. I think as in a crisis, uh, people revert to their base instincts, uh, the, adopting the most, uh, yeah, they adopt uh, polarized uh, narratives. So it makes it, it does make it difficult to have a, a dialogue or to find a nuanced position. But what have been some of your reactions uh, to people you've interacted? So in your Twitter profile, do you interact with more more leftist, or do you also in interact with some dissident right types? Well, it can be both. Uh, on Twitter, I'm generally more active on Facebook, actually. Mm -hmm. You know what I find kind of funny, though, and I guess this is maybe a case of history, maybe not quite repeating, but rhyming is far right and far left, or the authoritarian strains of both, sometimes are kind of hard to tell apart. Um, there's, whether it's somebody along the lines of the Proud Boys or the, the Patriot Prayer Warriors on the one hand, or these Antifa types on the other, they, what I notice is that they tend to argue from intimidation a lot. They don't so much advance arguments, it's just imply that there's something terribly wrong with, with what I'm saying because I'm saying it. 
Now, my experience is such that I'm not going to go down these rabbit holes with these people. If they have an argument against me, they can just come out and say it. But, um, I mean, a lot of cases are, you know, they're not really like that. Um, I'm finding, of course, there are people who figure that uh, Derek Chauvin, the uh, the officer who knelt down on the neck of, uh, of George Floyd and some of these other cops, well, they didn't do nothing, eh? The police didn't do nothing. And then other people are kind of saying things like just abolish or completely defund the police entirely. And I think it would be nice if we could come up with actual practical answers to this problem. There is this emotional intensity and everyone's going to have their visceral emotional reaction, uh, whether it's to, especially to like visual imagery, the image of the police brutality of that, of the incident of the cop putting his knee on the, on George Floyd's neck. Mm -hmm. And that, that brings a strong emotional response. Yeah, that people well, it's also an awful see, thing to see. Eh? Yeah, yeah. People also see imagery of looting and stores on fire, and that brings about an emotional response. Yeah, people do have very strong, strong opinions, and uh, just observing the media narratives, the, I noticed the the media narratives are focusing on on the whole kind of racial angle, and a lot of that has been there has been this push for. A strong kind of woke agenda on the ra on the race identity side, but I notice there's been less of a talk of class issues, income inequality, and also like the problems of the police state in general. Yeah, Robert, to speak to your point, um, I, I think we talked about this on the show that you and I did, but obviously there's a very strong reaction to be had to all the visual stuff we're getting, all of the news, and a lot of us are probably, you know, reverting back to a more right-wing or even boomer con sort of uh, a lot of us are probably reverting back to a sort of boomer con state of mind um on the right anyway uh so i've had to kind of remind myself not to not to over not to overcorrect. i mean these uh these um calls to deep on the police i think are completely ridiculous but i actually just retweeted something from my friend john um about uh you know how there there actually probably is a conversation to be had about how you know, in certain areas, I have to look at the numbers, but in certain in certain departments, in certain cities, too a bit too much is probably spent on the police. There's probably a, a over militarized police, over uh, over policing. These are real issues that I'd definitely be willing to talk about, even though I am on the right in a lot of ways on this. Um, and of course, also with the military itself. Uh, One example of that is there was a bill in the Senate that would give like federal law enforcement powers to warrantless surveillance of people's browsing history and some people i know uh, tulsi gabbard was vocal about that but the same a lot of the same people who are talking about the police issues in the media like the mainstream central left media was yeah i mean this was a huge they'd be in favor of that yeah i'm yeah. sure actually sure a lot of them actually would be in favor of that and we'll go so there's a, i think there's there's absolutely no i don't want to overstate this but there's there's pretty much no ideological consistency to to the overwhelming uh, message that we're getting from the left. No, no, not, not at all. Uh, Ryan, would you say the issue in our society, it's more it's more of an issue of plutocracy rather than white supremacy? Like one point, well, I actually saw this on, from a, like actually a more right-wing uh, Twitter account just now, but someone made a good point, is why is there such a strong harp on hate speech, but not on greed? Yeah, well... Here's something from the World Socialist website. So, not exactly an unbiased source. But it's a really good three-part article on police violence. And one of the paragraphs in it reads, Police violence is focused overwhelmingly on men lowest on the socioeconomic ladder. In the rural of the South, predominantly white men. In the Southwest, disproportionately Hispanic men. In mid-size... Well, I mean, as regards the current issue... Well, here's a little clip from a, a, an article I found about this from the World Socialist website. Not exactly an unbiased source. I'll read you a bit of the paragraph. It says, Police violence is focused overwhelmingly on men lowest on the socioeconomic ladder. In rural areas outside the South, predominantly white men. In the Southwest, predominantly Hispanic men. In mid-size and major cities, disproportionately black men. Significantly in the rural South, where the population is racially mixed, 
white and black men are killed by police at nearly identical rates. What unites these victims is not their race, but their class status, as well, of course, as their gender. The narrative we're getting is that law enforcement in the United States is, for all intents and purposes, the Klan without robes. If we, if we see it that way, then, ironically, we're not going to address this issue properly. And then there was that, uh, that post you tweeted from... It was an Al Jazeera article on the, the race statistics on police killings. Yeah. Yeah, that was on Twitter. Uh... Oh, good. Is this the, this is the article where you're talking about how uh, Southwest, it's disproportionately Hispanic men that are killed, Southeast, white men, those kinds of statistics? Yes, yes. Yeah, that sounded interesting. That was from the, that was from the world socialist website article. I'm not sure offhand what the Al Jazeera one says. I'll have to get to that here. So, I mean, that's it. And it concerns me to some degree that the issue is framed entirely in terms of race. Well, that part of it, I think there needs to be conversations about a lot of other things, too, like maybe, like, say, this macho, militaristic warrior culture in a lot of police departments in America. That gets mentioned sometimes, and it contributes to a very negative climate, very bad relations between the police and the general public. I mean, another thing you can do one of these days is go over to YouTube and in its search engine type the phrase, why you should not talk to the police. And you'll get video after video after video after video people, a lot of them lawyers, legal experts, even ex-cops, and it really goes into the Fifth and Sixth Amendments of the United States uh, on the Constitution. When police say anything you can, anything you say can and will be used against you, they mean it. Yeah, I mean, you responded to a comment on Twitter that was like this, the argument that someone would make that in a homogenous environment, that this wouldn't, this would be less of an issue. That this only happens in multi-ethnic environments, uh, as far as police brutality goes. I say again, that's a factor because, uh, like a mono-ethnic or mono-cultural society, has a greater sense of maybe social solidarity altogether. So the idea of the police looking at the citizenry as the enemy would be a more difficult thing uh, to, to have established and become entrenched. So, I mean, I think it's a factor for sure, possibly. But, I mean, what do you think of Zach Gold... Do you, are you familiar with Zach Goldberg from Twitter? Uh, do I follow him? Yeah, or do you know about him? Do you know what he's Zach about? Zach Goldberg doesn't sound familiar, I'm afraid. He, uh, yeah, it's a pretty nondescript name, but he posts a lot of... Um, He's a uh, he's a PhD student, I, I believe, studying data science, and he, he kind of specializes. He focuses on studying the changes in American political perceptions over the past ten or twenty years, specifically what he calls the Great Awakening. So, kind of studying how uh, you know left of center folks and just people in general have drifted towards the kind of uh, identity politics based leftism that we're talking about. He posted some interesting graphs last night um, that I don't have directly in front of me, but basically uh, pointing out the degree to which uh, mainstream media and others have really talked about um, racism and diversity and diversity training and white privilege and, and concepts like this. It's, it's skyrocketed since, since about 2010, 2011, basically since the time of Occupy Wall Street. I mean, I'm not a total conspiracy theorist, but it's kind of interesting to think how at that moment when Occupy Wall Street happened, when it, after the 2008 financial crash, it seemed to be there was some more of a class consciousness, anti-1% sentiment raising. And at just that moment, um, certain powerful factions within society lilted towards uh, talking about race in this incredibly divis divisive way. Yeah, that makes sense. I've thought about that. I've heard... Some I've read in a few places that 
the embracing of wokeness among corporate culture is a way to endear themselves to a population that lost faith in them after the 2008 financial crisis. Yeah. Uh, is there something more sinister going on? Well, the United States is the country of J. Edgar Hoover. It's the country of the counterintelligence program, Co-IntelPro, mm -hmm. using these kinds of dirty tricks to destabilize dissent and uh, popular movements aimed at shifting the way power works in the states. So things that I can't prove, but I do suspect. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm not an outright conspiracy theorist, but I mean, we have to recognize the potential of, of this kind of thing, especially with recent events. But what were you going to say, Robert? Well, I mean, World Capital has existed to some degree for a long time. I'm sure even in advertisement in the 90s, but I noticed like there was this trend where it really happened like right after uh, Occupy Wall Street, so that makes it seem like it was a deliberate uh, advertisement strategy. One of the things I've been thinking of the past few days, especially after kind of moving past the initial processing and anger phase of, of looking at the riots, is uh, the degree to which if you're if you're like a uh, um, an anti if you're part of the anti woke left, if you're like one of these uh, you know Bernie Sanders supporters who wants to move past identity politics like this has got to be like a worst case scenario where you have you know a, 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 something resembling an uprising and it's supported by every major corporation i mean this has got to be a kind of worst case scenario for that crowd well i think the thing that would be on their lips is co-optation yeah no completely. i mean i think that segment of the of the population feels like okay this is a very legitimate issue and we can get behind some of what black lives matter is saying here but you dig a little bit deeper and you find a much more bizarre ideology there there they emphasize like a universal white guilt and this kind of very i think destructive and divisive thing yeah it kind of reminds me as uh the whole thing where uh uh, Colonel West uh, criticized uh, Tanahishi Coates. I forget the exact uh, like article or quote, but basically saying that, making the point that his sort of focus on the moral moral grievance angle, rather than uh, materialistic uh, demands. That's sort of what I got. What I got from that. Yeah, no, I, I, was, I think it was just a tweet from Cornell West. Uh, I believe it was right after Charlottesville, although that may uh, that it may have been completely unconnected. Uh, but basically, just um, you know, Tana AC Coates is kind of. Uh, I mean, he has some talent as a writer, I suppose. I've read some of his stuff, and it kind of seems like the function of, of his writing uh, is very much. I mean, his, his audience basically predominantly white as far as I understand it. And he kind of writes about the issues in such a way where it's like, it reduces to, like, this is the kind of stuff that academic type of people, many of whom are white, like to read just for this sense of assuaging their white guilt. But, I mean, he doesn't, uh, ta 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 Coates doesn't really talk about any, like, real meat and potatoes, pragmatic political issues beyond just, uh, it's basically just pure identitarianism. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that's that's basically what it is. Too. And uh, yeah, yeah. If you mean if you look at woke uh, capital, obviously the pan the pandemic uh, and the whole like that shut down the economy, and that I mean that's a major factor for there being mass unemployment. But basically, the policies of neoliberalism and woke capital have cr contributed to this climate. Because I made this point on the previous show, you have a generation of young people who have been basically robbed of a future of economic prosperity. And then you combine that with the identity grievance culture in the media and academia, and the combination of the two is going to create a mess like this. Yeah, no, well, our friend uh, Daryl Basarab, uh, very small Twitter account, but uh, kind of legendary in certain online circles, he's been he's been tweeting a lot about how, uh, you know, really it's it's the, 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 the kind of racial wage gaps that exist for boomers uh, really don't even exist for millennials, like, uh, because that's where the real disparity lies. From a kind of political standpoint, that's actually been my observation in, in California. Uh, yeah, I mean, most of the wealth in real estate is, yeah, owned by older people. So that divide is bigger. Like when you, if you meet a lot of, like a lot of millennials and Gen Z in California, you know, some situation like one example is there's this argument 
about intergenerational wealth and the and the and the racial gap in in gener- intergenerational wealth. So one argument that they'll make is like say in California there was this period where people could buy up all this real estate that's incredibly valuable now, or at least until recently, and then it passed on mm-hmm. through intergenerational wealth and. The woke left will make an argument for race-based redistribution, but if you look at the situation, like white millennials in California are really not, I mean, they're not really doing much better than uh, POCs. Uh, yeah, no, we're not. I mean, there's, there's just, uh, and I think uh, Ryan had posted maybe something about this, like really, there's a sense about the kind of baby boomer generation and even for some of Gen X, you know, there's just so much nepotism uh, amongst them, so much plutocracy, and there's this strong... I have this strong sense anyway that uh, that those generations just didn't do enough uh, to pass on their wealth or to pass on their legacy to their children to really focus on making the world any kind of better place um, for them. And rather, we're just kind of stuck in this thing. And this is my observation, is you have a lot of uh, like upper middle class or wealthier uh, liberal boomers uh, in California, and they're often the ones who will virtue signal on the racial issues but they're not really, uh, I mean, they're not doing a good job passing down wealth to their descendants. And I guess, I mean, one example of that is the whole, the housing issue, NIMBY versus YIMBY issue we've discussed on the show. Yeah. Now, here's something to think about. I mean, again, we've seen the rise of this, this sort of woke ideology. Now, again, it's been around for quite some time, but the mainstreaming of it had an interesting way of correlating with the, of course, the big Great Recession of 2008. The recession of 2008 then occupied Wall Street in 2012, and then the Great Awakening uh, began during the Obama era, like right after, basically right after Occupy Wall Street, and it got even more extreme under Trump. Yeah, like, I think part of what this was is the white males, particularly the lower middle and the working class, were the ones that took the biggest hit. So who all of a sudden is getting slammed in the media? It's kind of like blaming the victim, isn't it? It's kind of like saying, well, you know, our economic policies really hurt these people. But hey, they're a bunch of privileged white racists, so they deserved it, didn't they? Yeah, it's almost like, did you guys see the uh, you just lost your job thing that was trending on Twitter yesterday? Where it's like the woman getting arrested and she's like, they she's saying you're about to lose your job to the cop and they made some hip hop remix of it. I mean, I know that, that this wasn't focused on actual people losing jobs for reasons other than racism, but it's kind of, to me, that, that moment when that was gleefully spreading kind of felt symbolic of the way that uh, I think a lot of um, working to middle class white men probably feel looking at, uh, you know, the way that they're talked about by the mainstream liberal media. It could be using them as a, like the working class white male as a scapegoat to take away uh, any blame directed or rage directed against the plutocracy. To alleviate the guilt of the plutocracy. Yeah, they screwed the white male working class over, but to make it okay... They hype ideas that go on about how privileged the white male working class is. So, hey, taking them down a notch isn't such a bad thing, isn't it? Yeah, well, you, Ryan, you posted a, a article from Spiked Online yesterday, which I retweeted, which uh, I thought laid it out pretty well about the, just how uh, regressive um, the racial dialogue is at this point. I mean, you really do have... Uh, entire an entire you know group of people white men basically talked about as if they're like more prone to violence and all these things that yeah. are that are basically I, I I've resisted saying this in the past because I think sometimes p- playing the uh, reverse racism card is ineffective because people just roll their eyes but when we when we see it at this at this level I mean how how can you not start to point out that like basically not even just that it's like immoral but that it's just like that it's bullshit <laughs> what people are what the way people are reducing everything to race almost like a an inversion of how it used to be the the, the colored man that was stereotyped and pilloried, right? No, it, it, it completely feels that way, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, one perfect example of, like, woke capital is these corporations, like the gig economy. So you look at Uber Eats, uh, they posted that thing out about encouraging 
customers to patronize uh, African American uh, businesses. And uh, I mean, what's I mean, what's really ironic is the gig economy is the one that really is like exploiting their workers, and they're the ones who are going out of their way to virtue signal, like with Uber. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and another thing about woke capitalism, particularly media, is if you want to see how progressive they really are, try unionizing their workforces. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and the progressivism goes out the window fairly quickly. Mm. So a lot of it's very performative. It's it's very signaling. Um, you know, all the money they spend on uh, on woke virtue signaling, they can write off their taxes as corporate goodwill. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, I think, what it comes down to, to a this considerable is... extent. Yeah, I mean, it's just PR. But if, if you look at all these small businesses that got destroyed in the riots and looting, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this. Uh, this is just pure speculation. But if someone, a conspiracy minded person could speculate that like big money interests are behind it. Because just looking at the outcome, I think it could actually, like, in a sense, like wiping out the competition because a lot of these small businesses that were destroyed will be replaced by uh, big corporate chains. Big corporations and, and non brick and mortar establishments like Amazon, who obviously did virtue signal over this. Yeah, I mean, that was already happening with the uh, pandemic. Uh, Amazon, just look at Amazon's profits, uh, they're growing faster than ever. Just so putting aside the riots, just of the pandemic, like, people are. As these brick and mortar businesses uh, are gone, yeah, more and more online shopping is how is it is a trend. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not enough of a conspiracy theorist to say in any way that big corporations are behind anything. But I'll say this: that certainly, certainly, none of this hurts them even a little bit. You know, one or two Amazon, I guess, an Amazon warehouse burned down here, a, a truck got looted there, but it's not really hurting their business at all. This no, is no. why I roll my eyes when I see the anarchists and far left wing people celebrate the rioting and the looting and so on. I think give your head to shake people. Okay, you're depriving low income people of what little income they have. The big corporations have insurance for all of this and they just pass the costs on to their customers in the form of price increases and their employees in the form of wage uh, stagnation. This isn't going to hurt the Jeff Bezoses of the world. It's going to hurt the working class. And with this uh, call to defund the police, a lot of, I mean, a lot of mayors are going along with this. This could be a symbolic gesture to appease uh, protests. But to, let's just say hypothetically that were to happen, uh, we'll see more uh, private security, like that post, uh, there's a Twitter a Twitter post of, of this guy's observations on driving around Melrose in L.A. now, and you'll see like more private security, like a privatized police state, or you'll see that the police just protecting the wealthy and business interests and leaving, kind of leaving alone and not bothering with low-income communities. So, yeah, I mean, just going by the hypothetical, I think, increased inequality and privatized police state, I mean, that would be a worse uh, scenario. Yeah. So typically, the Antifa kids, the regressive left, shoot themselves in the foot, eh? It's the last thing they should want. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think, you know, when you have a uh, leftist of an anarchist slant, as you have with, with Antifa, uh, the, I, in my opinion, um, you know, their, their, their reading of the basic state of, of man in nature is so fundamentally wrong. Now, I actually don't yeah. know what Antifa exactly stands for, but just leftists in general, the kind of Rousseauian left, shall we say. Their basic read of the way man is in nature is so fundamentally wrong that they that they think things like just getting rid of the police force will somehow, uh, you know, spontaneously spawn a more egalitarian, less authoritarian state. When in reality, they're totally, in my opinion, you know, anarcho-Marxists and, and anarcho-fascists are, they're, by reducing, uh, you know, existing authority, but uh, the end goal would be the same for both of them. Kind of like a cyberpunk neo-reaction like where corporations uh, run the government and have their own police force? Something like that, yeah. It would be kind of like back to the future, right? Isn't that what feudalism and manorialism were? Private uh, ownership <laughs> over political function, basically? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but... you would replace kings and emperors with CEOs and board chairs, but at the end of the day, how much different would it be? 
But you're quite right, Matt, about these this particular kind of leftists. They're very romanticist and they're very utopian. Interestingly enough, they were kind of prominent in the 19th century. Karl Marx, of all people, was actually deeply criticized, critical of them. That's where his yeah. materialistic theories came from. Well, the thing is, is I don't actually see that happening. I don't see the defunding of the police. I think that the power structure will not, I mean, will not go along with the reduction in the powers of the police state. What I see is more likely is creating, what I see was more likely is creating quotas of arrest and convictions uh, that are directed as uh, white people, against white people. And uh, yeah, I mean, I could see Kamala Harris as attorney general who hypothetically would implement that kind of policy. Yeah, well, you know, this is another kind of another way in which this kind of leftism is so self-destructive. I mean, another thing they don't want to see is a rise in racial consciousness among white people, but that's a hell of a good way to actually cause that. How long are we going to tolerate? Really? Yeah, it is It is inevitable based on, based on current uh, trends. So what you advocate is more... You tend to reject identity politics, if you could say it's a sort of a civic nationalism that's left-winning economically. But I do think that based on current trends of how things are going, I think like a rise in white identity politics uh, is, is inevitable. Yeah, well, it's yes, exactly. But I guess, unfortunately, it's it's not going to be uh, an identity po- – it's going to be a, a, an identity politics counter to the current, you know, uh, black identity politics or per- person of color identity politics – in the sense that it's just going to be purely reactionary, very emotional, emotionally based, and not uh, as opposed to something better, which would be you know like uh, actually looking at the material needs of the white working class and how to best address that. It's going to be just a purely emotional counter reaction, which is going to lead to more uh, you know more more just like um, or just voting for the most like right wing Republican, like kind of what's been going on in the past, rather than doing something. As opposed to having like an in-group identity, you're able to provide for the needs of your group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, like that's the thing. Like it'll be it'll be reactionary, the white identity politics. And well, I mean, you could see it. Say Trump is kind of like this. But once in office, what does he do? Cut back, privatize, deregulation, etc. The class divide gets worse. Now this. I guess feeds into what I think of the maybe the fundamental mission of the alt left because remember it was founded as a kind of race conscious leftism for whites and this is maybe our great project I mean what would a good and dare I say it progressive identity politics for white people look like you know one that leaves the swastikas and the burning crosses and all that bullshit behind that has a lot of class consciousness and it's not going to see the black man or the people of color as the enemy but it's going to see maybe emphasize how anti-white sentiment is used as a tool of the ruling class Mm -hmm. kind of the same way anti-black prejudice was not so long ago yeah it is used as a tool of the of the ruling class and just so much like an identity that basically says that your group does have material needs that do need to be addressed. So yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that is a, a trend. Do you have any thoughts on Trump's uh, responses? It seems like he's trying to kind of appease both sides. He has tried to make a very strong diplomatic case directed more towards the sort of social justice and concerns of the protesters, but the problem is they all view him as a, they view him as a fascist, so that's not going to be effective. And then, yeah, and then trying to appeal to kind of law and order conservatives. So, but he is, is in a difficult uh, position, no matter what he does. He has nothing to gain politically from reaching to the left because they've all demonized him. Again, it's kind of the self-defeating nature of their politics. I mean. Rather than say, okay, look, Trump, uh, let's talk here. We'll work with you on some things if you're willing. And typically that's kind of what 
politics in America looked like back in the days and politics in America actually worked. But you're not going to get that out of the left today. It'll be a frosty day in hell before they do something like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know all the details of this, and nor do I necessarily approve of it. But, I mean, Trump uh, ha has, you know, kind of led this thing with Kushner, uh, which has gotten a lot of people out of jail. So in, in, in important ways, he has actually done some stuff you'd think some of these people would be happy about. But, of course, it's not really about the policies. It's more about what he symboli symbolizes, and, and yeah. they just literally see him as morally evil. Yeah, it, it's the, the left of today is really consumed by its own mythology. You know, and they've blown up Trump into this Antichrist figure. No, I'm not defending him necessarily, but again, I mean, the American political system is based on horse trading, maybe, for lack of a better term. You know, Democrats and Republicans certainly aren't going to agree on everything, but it's always been a, I'll give you a little bit of what you want if you give me a little bit of what I want, uh, and let's get something through Congress here. I definitely think there is division within the establishment. Uh, Bari Weiss, uh, she's a kind of center-left neoliberal type, but she had tweeted this thing that basically says at the New York Times there is like a strong divide between the old guard and the newer, like younger woke crowd about re I mean, reacting to this whole situation. So I think the establishment is yeah, divided I mean, as specifically, well. Yeah, specifically the Tom Cotton op-ed, uh, Republican oh, yeah. from Arkansas, who I didn't even read the piece, but he basically wrote... Uh, an op-ed um, recommending that Trump send in the National Guard or the military. I, again, I didn't read it, but I, the gist of it was 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 a strong response. And there was this big, and they, the, uh, the New York Times ended up, um, you know, reneging on it and saying that they should not have published it, uh, backing down basically, which is ridiculous because uh, obviously that sentiment is something that a lot of Americans were feeling at the time. In the past, the New York Times has published op-eds, uh, you know, by Vladimir Putin, by someone from the Taliban. Like it's it's always been their business to 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 print a, an array of opinions, and yet they they back down on this one due to the sentiments of, I, I guess, all the younger staffers they have. So it's creating this whole civil war in the new within yeah, the New York I've Times. Yeah, seen reference to that on Twitter, like sort of regarding the editorial leaning of the paper as a whole. And I mean, again, this woke crowd is very totalitarian in its thinking. Oh, yeah, they, for sure. Uh, Ryan, what would some of your solutions be to improve relations between the citizens and law enforcement and reducing incidents of uh, police brutality? Uh, a few things. Uh, demilitarization. Um, I would, like, if I was in a political position to do it, I would then training in warrior ethos um, men mentality among police, um, cultivating an us-versus-them attitude concerning uh, the relationship with the public. Um, what are some other things? There's a term um, like a certain kind of immunity or protection. There's a legal word for this, and I can't... Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It. Um, like a, a sort of immunity that they have. Um, um, uh, qualified immunity, right? Yes, yes, yes. I would maybe, I would certainly narrow the scope of that, maybe make it a little bit easier to successfully prosecute police uh, in cases where, in particular, it's really flagrant uh, abuse. Um, independent investigation and pros prosecution in the event, uh, again, of an investigation of an allegation of uh, police uh, br brutality. I mean, uh, you know, the fox can't keep guarding the hen house, so to, you know, as it were. I mean, it's sort of like asking oil companies to regulate the police themselves. Do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> so I would think things like that... Um, mandatory body cams uh, and it's illegal illegal to turn them off that would be another thing yeah um, as far as i know a lot of departments already do have body cams including minneapolis i mean that's one point i do feel is worth mentioning is that a lot of these departments have made uh, major major strides over the past 30 years i know some people would probably laugh at me for saying that but lapd for instance during the rodney king riots well they really did have a bad reputation then but uh, 
they're, they're, I live in LA, and I mean, their their reputation is, has improved considerably over the years. Not to push back on anything you're saying, because I, I agree that there's a lot of common sense reforms. That yeah, now be- part of the problem, though, is the, the time between the actual changing of the laws and the time of the changing of public perception. There's always yeah. quite a gap here. Yeah, a lot sure. of these types of measures have been implemented uh, even in uh, even in uh, Minnesota, where uh, George Floyd was killed, that that police department had implemented a fair number of progressive reforms leading up to this. So part of it, too, is a cultural change that's going to take some time to work through. Problem, though, is, of course, and as usual in the media, media has an incentive to editorialize and slant things in a very sensationalistic manner. Giving a racial spin on police violence creates controversy, controversy sells. That's a big problem. And what do you see as the political implications out of this, especially coming into the election in the fall? Really hard to say. Really hard to say. I mean, again, it's almost like 1967, 1968 is playing itself out all over again. Similar kinds of things. I mean, will demands for, say, restitution to the black community prevail over people's legitimate concerns about law and order? We want racial justice, yes. We want people treated fairly, regardless of skin color, absolutely but we don't like the rioting and the looting. That's what the statistics have shown. Uh, I think it was like 70% of people supported, you know, it, the, the potential of calling in the National Guard to quell the rioting, but uh, over 50% also, uh, pretty well over 50%, I believe, also, you know, were sympathetic to the anger behind the protesting. So that's, I guess, the, the, the core demographic of America right there is 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 not necessarily against the protests, but is in favor of, of law and order, as it were. Um, yeah. So that's the big middle middle ground. And I mean, we've seen, uh, to answer Robert's question, we've seen uh, the numbers seem to be initially uh, better for Biden, worse for Trump. But I tweeted something this morning, like, uh, the Trump has always had a little bit of an enthusiasm gap over Biden, and I feel like that's only going to increase, given that he is going to be seen by a lot of people as a strong anti-riot candidate, whereas Biden, it's, it's hard to say how much the protests really align with Biden. I mean, he's, he's obviously a centrist here, so I don't know. It will depend on whether Biden and the Democrats are associated with a lot of the problems, and also what continues. Like, will there be incidents throughout the summer? Will this continue? It does seem to be simmering down in the short term, but will there be other big events, or will there just be like a general uh, crime wave? If there is a crime wave, that's also tied with just the whole economic situation as well and mass unemployment and you know we've got a long and very perilous road ahead of us as regards the trial and prosecution of Derek Chauvin as well that's a minefield I mean George Floyd's uh, family wants Chauvin charged with first degree murder but given what I've read about this that would be very very hard to prove so charge him with, you know, they've up to the charges second degree murder, but originally it was third degree murder, which wasn't that much more severe, if at all, than manslaughter. That, of course, doesn't carry a life in, in prison sentence, but much, much easier to actually get a conviction. So which way does the prosecution go here? It's going to be tough whatever they do. If they charge him with first degree murder, but he gets acquitted? Boy, oh boy, man, you better find yourself a good bomb shelter. It is a very difficult situation. Yeah, it's a nationwide crisis. Before I wrap up the yep. show, do you want, did any of you want to add like any, any other words? Uh, I mean, I would just say I think we set out at the beginning to find a nuanced understanding of, of recent events, and I think we found that. I thought it was a really, a really good show. Yeah, I think it was a good chat. Uh, Ryan England, uh, it's been an excellent show. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me. Look forward to doing it again. And also, thanks, Matt Pagan. Sure thing.